Hello, this is Deborah Anderson, the Black Woman Animator. Come back to you with another video. And in this video, I have Danny Williams. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Can you introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Uh, my name is Danny Williams. Um, I'm currently living in upstate New York and um, working remotely for a company called Phoenix Labs. That's what's up. All right. So you're from the South Bronx um, and then you eventually moved to Harlem when you were a teenager. How was it growing up? What is your origin story? Man, you did your homework. Um, so uh, I grew up in the South Bronx um, with my grandmother raising me. Um, and then when I got to be a teenager, I was getting a little bit, you know, too much for her to handle. My aunt and uncle, thankfully, uh, stepped in and um, sort of took over from there. And through my high school years, I lived with them uh, uptown in, in Harlem. Um, you know, growing up is crazy because you look back now, um, for me, you know, I'm a date myself right off the bat. Um, you know, that's that's during the 80s, you know, is South Bronx and crack is everywhere. And it's like crazy. But when you when you think about it and you go back, there's a lot of like stuff going on, but mm -hmm. it's just how you grow up and you don't think about it. So right. for me, it was just day to day. You know what I mean? Just regular, regular life. You know, um, but it was a definitely much better situation when I moved in with my aunt and uncle, I'll tell you that. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, your parents passed away when you were young. Like, what? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, my father passed away. My my mother and father, unfortunately, were both um, uh, heroin users. And uh, my mom passed away from an overdose. My dad actually contracted uh, AIDS um um or hiv and uh and passed away from that um but even pre them you know passing away and getting sick um the drugs just took them they just weren't a part of my early life so i was like living with my grandmother um and we always had like an aunt or an uncle or somebody that was like also staying there you know kind of deal um but you know that was just that was just life you know what i mean so it just was what it was mm -hmm yeah what um what are your, some of your best childhood memories oh man a lot um so i'll tell you one thing and, and the thing that's different now so like you know my my youngest daughter now is um 13 years old and we live at such different times i can't imagine her going someplace unsupervised or someplace where we don't know where she's at right Being in this growing up in the city on the weekends, especially like you jump on the train and you just go anywhere, right? So mm -hmm. you hop the train and you go anywhere. I used to love to go down to um, uh, the village, to Greenwich Village. There used to be a place called the Unique Boutique. And I was someone that always loved to draw. And mm -hmm. these guys were airbrushing shirts, but like doing it on a level. I had a small, I didn't even have a compressor. I had a, a can of air and an airbrush. And um, these guys were like my heroes. And I went there so much that a couple of the artists started to befriend me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they would knock on the window and be like, hey, come here. Like, you know, they give me a couple of dollars, go to McDonald's, get me this or whatever. And then I come in and then they'll give me like a little like art tip, tap me on the head and be like, go up, go back outside. And I'd go outside <laughs> and I just watch them through the windows sort of working because they and they would always be a big crowd because they just yeah. like making these masterpieces on shirts and jackets and all that kind of stuff and i ended up going and doing that when i was a teenager just because i was so influenced by by those guys so that's one huge memory um mm -hmm. from growing up that i loved yeah yeah i randomly took a airbrushing class in college um <laughs> like my, i had like i think i still have a, a shirt that i made <laughs> yeah did you like it yeah it came out really good i, I did like the class um it just was like sustaining the the the, the hobby was like eh, all yeah. right <laughs> i still i still have a compressor back there somewhere and, mm -hmm. and my little airbrush is back there in a the drawer somewhere but mm -hmm. i haven't done it i haven't done it in years yeah yeah so what is your cultural makeup makeup and that's not to just say what's your ethnicity but also what is the culture of where you grew up and then the uniqueness of where you're from yeah, so I'm what they call a Bronx special. One parent is black and the other parent is Puerto Rican. So that's just that's super common from from where I'm from. Mm -hmm. um, now nowadays I think you would see it as common with yeah. 
Puerto Rican and Dominican or Dominican and black, like that kind of mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, that's basically. But you're Miles what, Morales. <laughs> I guess, I guess I'm, I'm a much, much worse Miles Morales, but it was, it was sort of like that. And it was weird. Like, um, so culturally it was like just a bunch of, where I grew up, it was just a bunch of people in the same sort of situation. Mm-hmm. And there really wasn't a big, there really wasn't a big like separation. Like um, I have a buddy that lives in Chicago. Um, shout out to my buddy, Charlie. Mm-hmm. And he, he will always tell me about how segregated Chicago is. Right. Yeah. And now that I'm older and understand a little bit more, I do see some level of segregation, like where I came from, but it's yeah. nothing like we just was all together. You know what I mean? It was just like, yeah, it was just a, like my whole crew was just a bunch of like black Puerto Ricans. And I don't think we had too many Dominican kids back then. Um, mm-hmm. But now it's like Dominicans are everywhere. So <laughs> yeah. my wife is, my wife is a Dominican. So, mm-hmm. yeah. but, but yeah. Um, what was your favorite, maybe like tradition, like family tradition growing up? Um, so my aunt and uncle that, uh, that ended up taking me in, um, we would go sometimes to their house for, uh, Christmas. Right. Mm -hmm. And it really, it really was like a sort of micro version of like some, some fresh prints type thing. Like they were like way better off than a lot of people in the family. So it was mm-hmm. always like a big deal, like, oh, we're going over there for Christmas. You know what I mean? Or mm-hmm. the the um the apartment complex that they that they lived in, it was condos um uh called Espinar Gardens. And they had mm-hmm. um there's a pool there. So in the summer they would actually get me a pool pass and I would go over there and I would spend, you know, my whole time, even before I lived over there, mm-hmm. they were just trying to keep me, you know, occupied. You know what yeah. I mean? So yeah. yeah, that 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 was that was good that time mm-hmm. so, yeah so um you're an excellent artist and a lot of people look up to you looking back why do you think you were a bad student <laughs> oh man I think um I think really being honest looking back I was I was someone that didn't get a lot of challenge um in school and I also was always like kind of the jokey one, the funny one, like that kind of thing. So um, I think falling in with other kids that sort of were like that, none of us really had that big of an interest in academics, you know, but every single year, I always had at least one teacher at just one. And I might say for all my other teachers, I don't care about you, 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 you there was always at least one where it's like, I can't disappoint you, you know, right. all, all the way up through high school. It was like that. Um, you know, so I, I was a knucklehead, but only up to a point, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. And with that one teacher, was it like, they cared about you and that's why you didn't want to disappoint them. They cared about everybody. Like, like one that really stands out. Um, I had a teacher named Mrs. Robinson and this is, this is back in the days, you know, where you could, you know, your teachers, Sometimes teachers would would hit you, you know what I mean? And it's like my teacher, this is a public school. She had a, a band of rulers that were like all really, it was like a bunch of wooden rulers mm-hmm. and they were rubber banded together. She would come over and tell you to hold out your hand, but she would never actually hit you hard. Mm-hmm. She just would go like this. But mm-hmm. all of the students loved her so much and we respected her so much that the shame of the whole rest of the class just looking at you like, like, look what you made her do. You know what I mean? It was so bad. It was so bad. It was horrible. Um, but I always had at least one teacher like that all the way up through high school. At high school, I had a few of them. There's uh-huh. a man named Mr. Mehmet. When I went to go to college, he's the one that actually drove me to college. Um, nice. Yeah. And uh, another teacher, uh, Mr. Figueroa, just tremendous, like, science teacher. Like, like you, you ever seen the beginning of Lean on Me? Mm-hmm. Like when Morgan Freeman is sitting there with the dashiki and everyone's engaged, yes. that's how it was. That's how it was in Figueroa's class. Like everybody was just engaged, like a hundred percent. We couldn't wait to get there. People are fighting to get the, to a good seat, that kind of thing. In mm-hmm. a school where you your next class the bell rings, your next class you just kind of like oh, I'm not going. 
right? <laughs> but to his class, you go to his class. Yeah, it was it was crazy. Yeah, I always had at least one good teacher. Always. I think that's what really got me through. Yeah, yeah. that's what's up. Um, yeah. is there a funny story your family tells about you that you like to share? Oh man, wow. Um, <clears throat> let's see. There's a couple. I don't know how many of them I can share here. Um, so so uh, there's one, right? One of my favorite aunts, she still lives down in the Bronx. There was a guy um, that, that when I was growing up, he was the janitor in our building. Mm -hmm. And he always sort of had lusty eyes for my aunt. And I would always, even as a kid, I'd be like, eh, like get out of here, you know, whatever. And I was running around, I was writing graffiti and stuff like that. So he was constantly like chasing us around, that kind of thing or whatever. And someone told this man that I was riding on top of the elevators, which I never did. Mm -hmm. I knew people that did them. Someone said that I did it. And he actually came to the apartment, told my grandmother I got in trouble. Like I was on punishment. Like it was terrible. And <clears throat> the story he likes to tell is that he saw me walking into the building about a month later. I'm off punishment. And I just have a giant branch, like like from a tree, just a big giant branch. And he's like, I better not find that branch anywhere in here. I was like, you won't. And I ended up going up in the elevator. I ended up, you know, sort of pushing that thing, wedging it, went all the way up to the top floor, wedged it between the two elevators and caused one of the elevators to get stuck. And he knew who did it. And I was like, if, I, if I'm gonna get in trouble, I'm gonna get in trouble for something you know I did or whatever. So he loves to tell that story. And now after all these years, that's actually my uncle Pete. And uh, he ended up marrying my aunt. And uh, yeah, I loved, I loved him to death. But man, growing up, I hated his guts. Hated him, hated him. Yeah. That's funny. Yep. <laughs> so yeah. let's take a deep dive into what is your journey in art and animation during your, during your childhood up until you know mm -hmm. college or even adulthood? <laughs> Yeah. So like I said, I always liked to draw and paint. Um, and there were people who I grew up around that also were interested in art. And um, that really, it, it made me think like, oh yeah, this is an okay hobby to have. Mm -hmm. And then, then, like I said, when I got to like observing working artists, like even at that place, that, that unique boutique place, just seeing like, oh wow, these guys are getting paid to do that. I would love to do that. And then all the way up into sort of high school, starting to be the person that like, oh, there's a school ski trip or something like that. I can't afford to go, but I could negotiate with the people. Hey, if I do some flyers with like Bart Simpson or whatever on a you know, pair of skis or whatever, and I make mm -hmm. the flyer, can I go? Yeah. You know? And I didn't realize one of my teachers was actually, he was, he was the person in charge of the trip. I thought he had to the juice to just go, oh yeah, you're going for free. He was paying for me. You know, mm. for all of these types of things. And I didn't know, you know what I mean? So, um, which is, which is great, but I got to experience yeah. a lot of things just from like, just starting to see like, oh, there's something in art. Uh, when I got to college, I wanted to be an art teacher really because my art teacher in high school was terrible. She was horrible. She, she literally all the stuff that I liked about making art, she almost like took it out of me. Like that's, yeah. Yeah, she was just terrible. And then it and it's a weird, like warped kind of thinking, but it's like, oh, if she could do this, I could do better than that. <laughs> so, all right, how am I gonna make money but then stay in the arts? And then I ended up, you know, doing that. And then also while I was in, in college, taking those education classes and also taking some art classes, two things happened. I saw a Toy Story one day, and then mm -hmm. the very next day I bumped into a friend of mine named Danielle who totally changed the course of my life. She was like, oh yeah, I'm taking, I didn't, I was like, I didn't know you were taking art classes. I saw her in the art building. She's like, oh yeah. Like, I didn't know she was interested in art at all. Turns mm -hmm. out she was like a terrific drafts person, all of that. Mm -hmm. And she's just like, hey, if you um, come with me to the graphics lab. And I was like, what's this? And we got in there and I was like, oh, this is the Toy Story stuff. And then I was like, oh, okay, cool. I know what I want to do with the rest of my life. From that point on, I was mm -hmm. like, okay, people are doing this and making a living and I have an opportunity to learn how to do it here. I'm mm -hmm. going to learn how to do this. I want to do this. And it became my singular focus after that. I was like not interested in anything else. So, you know, yeah, that was, that's pretty much how I, how I got here. Yeah. So, um, 
was your family like supportive of your artistic interests or was it just something to keep you out of trouble or they were yeah they were not not supportive mm -hmm. they were just like whatever if you're going to do something that's not getting you in any trouble or you're not you know misbehaving or whatever just go 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 do that like it could have been anything it could have been that or it, literally anything else you know mm -hmm. i want to make the world's best sandwiches they would have been totally fine with it so yeah <clears throat> So um, let's go through, uh, can you list some of like prominent projects that you've worked on? Sure. Um, so I'm, I'm super old. Uh, so I worked on um, a few things. Be so I was at Blue Sky Studios for uh, 11 years, like the first 11 years of my career. Mm -hmm. And this was like pre Ice Age even. Um, and then getting to work on like the first few movies that they did, like Ice Age and Gordon Here's a Who and, you know, Second Ice Age, a little bit of the first Rio. I was like almost at the end of my run by yeah. then. Um, and then worked on a few movies at DreamWorks, um, uh, worked on a few games for Activision. Like, you know, you can see all of this stuff on my my website, basically like like the history of what I've done. Um, yeah. But at this point, I think I've worked on like a few AAA games and, a, you know, a few films, um, you know, and I've, I've had mostly a good time through all of it, you know, so yeah. Is there any project that you worked on that was like memorable because of whether it's the storyline, the people you worked with or anything? Man, um, there's little things you remember about everyone um, mm -hmm. and and people that you even at the time you take for granted sometimes, oh, I get to work with, you know, this person, but then a few years pass and you don't get to work with them anymore. Um, and you go, man, I really actually adored working with so-and-so, you know what I mean? So it's like, there's so many people on the, on the early Blue Sky films, there was a gentleman by the name of Rob Cardone. Mm -hmm. um, his, his brother is Thomas Cardone, who's an art director. Um, or he was an art director on a lot of the films at uh, at Blue Sky, but Rob was the head of our uh, layout department, and he had worked on like Tarzan and all these movies for Disney, and we were a studio that had never made a movie, so we didn't really know. We'd worked on a bunch of commercials and shots for films, mm -hmm. so we had like a technical expertise, but we didn't. We never made a full movie, so yeah. just the amount of things that I would learn from him um on a daily basis that he would just say so matter of factly and I would have to register in my head like oh remember that that's a good lesson remember that mm -hmm. you know and it's like see so yeah people like that there was another guy named Peter Clark and mm -hmm. just a quick side story Peter Clark and I hated each other working on Age. like we hated each other I was in charge of the environments um the, the modeling of the environments mm -hmm. and Peter Clark was one of the environment designers and I wanted to be kept in the loop about, and this is just being young and being put in a management position. And I didn't yeah. know what I was, the, the truth is, I just didn't know what I was doing. Um, but Peter was going directly to the artist, like, hey, can we scooch this tree to the left? Can we do that? Can we do whatever? And I was like, Peter, you got to come to me and talk to me. And really, if I really think about it, what he was doing was probably correct, you know? Mm -hmm. But man, we just clashed so much. Years later, when I was ready to leave Blue Sky, I was looking around and I applied to a game studio. Um, ZBrush was relatively new at the time and it was like something yeah. I really was interested in. So I was like, games use ZBrush a lot. I spent like a year and taught myself like a games pipeline at home. And then I ended up um, applying to a bunch of game studios. One of them called me and was like, hey, our art director would like to speak to you. Can we set up a call? I was like, sure. Mm -hmm. They're in Seattle. I was in Oregon at the time uh, interviewing mm -hmm. at Leica. And um, I get the call. And again, it's someone from the studio saying, hey, we'd like to know if we can fly you up, you know, or fly you out, you know, to mm -hmm. like talk to you or whatever. And I was like, well, I'm right in Oregon right now. So they ended up booking me like a rental car and I just drove it. And, mm -hmm. then, um, and then they set me up in a hotel for like a few days. And they paid for the rental car and everything. And I was like, man, this is this is living. When I finally get the call from the art director, it's Peter Clark. It's the guy. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this ain't gonna work. This, this is not this is not a thing. And <clears throat> when we he's like, hey, just you know, come out, let's have dinner, let's talk, you know, whatever. And whether you like it or not, don't worry about it, you know, whatever. 
And I wrote down all the things that I had now matured over the years a little bit. And I was mm-hmm. just like, here's all the things I think I was wrong about. And I put them in a little notepad just so I had it. And when mm-hmm. I went and sat down with him, we sat down across from each other and we were speaking. And he said all the things to me that I knew I wanted to say to him. Mm. And he felt all the same things that I felt like, man, what a missed opportunity. You seem like you really passionate about what you do, like all of these things. And I was like, Peter, look, and I took out my notepad and I showed it to him. And we both, you know, we sat there, we had dinner, we laughed. And he was Mm -hmm. like, hey, listen, if you want to come work out here, you know, like I would love to like just all other stuff, clean slate, like, and let's just work together. And I went out there and I worked for him for a couple of years. And then sadly, the game got canceled. Um, But uh, I had a great time. And again, Mm -hmm. once I opened my mind to learning from him, he was another person that was like just a mountain of knowledge, learning Mm -hmm. from him every single day after that, just because I put my ego to the side. It made such a big difference. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, I saw you say something that I feel like people my age and younger would never do. It's like not the culture to admit that you don't know anything, but I saw you say that when you were started working at the game studio, you're like afraid because you never worked in games. So you're like, I don't know mm-hmm. what I'm doing. And like people are afraid to admit that they don't know what they're doing. What's the power of just like leaning into, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's massive. Uh, so me and a couple of friends of mine, we all started teaching in New York at the same time. We were, we were all at Blue Sky. And there were a few um, schools there. Um, I was at SVA and NYU. A friend of mine was teaching at Pratt. We were all relatively young. We all just started. The schools liked that we, like I was only two or three years older than the people in class. And they didn't Mm -hmm. know that. They just knew, oh, this guy works at Blue Sky. Mm -hmm. But the the same music they listened to, the same slang they used, same clothes they wear, like we were the same. Mm -hmm. And we could have been peers, but it was just, I had the opportunity a few years before them to learn from people that knew a lot more than me. And my, our first few years teaching, all of us had the same struggle. Our schedule, my, my syllabus was like super thick and it was scheduled out to like half an hour segments for like three hour classes, 15 weeks. Mm -hmm. And it was like ridiculous. And I was like stressing every week, staying up super late. We're going to cover these things this week. I need to have all my ducks in a row, try to anticipate every question, this, that, and the third. And then finally, what it ended up being was about the second or third year teaching, all of us came to the same revelation. Mm -hmm. And we gave similar speeches to all of our classes. And it was just, I do not know everything. We are going to encounter things that I don't know. But it's my job to go find out and bring it back to you next week. Right. And it it finally made teaching a joy. That before that, it was like, okay, this is like a good little extra side hustle paycheck. Mm-hmm. But after that, it was like, oh yeah, you can relax and connect. And it was it taught me such a valuable lesson. And nobody knows everything, right? And at that game studio, whatever, if I was going from film to games, it's different going from film studio to film studio to film studio. You go to three, you'll find the culture and the way that they do things varies a little bit Mm -hmm. going from film to games was like night and day whole different thing I was not going to step into a situation without the studios that I was talking to to each one of them I was like I have never worked in games I have worked a lot in production on film I know this is different but I'm the hardest worker you're going to find and I I promise you it's not going to stay that way but to give me a shot right it was like really the, the pitch and I'm lucky that um, that ArenaNet did that for me. So yeah, mm-hmm. super lucky. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the power like, power of I don't know is huge. Sorry. Yeah, I feel like through the pandemic, um, I had a lot of uh, interviews at game studios, and it was mostly them reaching out to me because you know, quite as kept, I wasn't like <laughs> I kind of gave up. I was like, oh man, I'm too old to be like a PA. They not gonna hire me. <laughs> like, um, and so. Like they would reach out to me through LinkedIn and stuff like that. And it was like this disconnect of the recruiters to the people who were actually hiring. Cause it's like the recruiters saw the potential, but then the people actually hiring will be like, you don't have games experience. And I'm like, then why did y'all reach out to me? <laughs> and it's just like, if I, maybe if I had done that in the interview where it's like, I've never worked in games, but you know, 
but it just I'm like, yeah, I not know about Trent's purple skill. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, and that's the thing, right? So you have to talk up that part, and it's like, yeah. you know. Also, I think it takes pressure off of you. Mm-hmm. Like, we've all been in situations where you start a job and you and fake it till you make it mode, mm-hmm. but now you don't have to fake it. You yeah. just, you know, you work until you make it, right? And it's just like, yeah, I'm a, I'm gonna prove to you that I'm gonna bust my butt to get to that point where you don't have to hold my hand as much anymore, you know? And mm-hmm. it's like that. That's the goal, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Something I've told people is like. That first six months to a year, you're allowed to be dumb. <laughs> like, yeah. like nobody expects you to know everything. <laughs> that yeah. first, like at least six months, like ask questions. I mean, you're yeah. supposed to ask questions all the time, but yeah, for sure. And you can. I think one thing about getting a little older in this industry is you start to understand like good information comes from everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. You could have someone that's only been doing this a year or two, but they learned something from someone, you know, either they've learned about doing it themselves or they've learned something from someone that might have more experience than you. But they took that nugget and they say it out loud or show you a thing or whatever. And now you have that part for you. If you're closed off and just go as young person's not going to teach me anything, you you never you're never going to grow. Never, never. never. You know, so it's like, yeah, you just be open, you know. Yeah, I'm type. I'm a teacher, but if I I'll go watch a beginner you tutorial in a second, I'm like, oh, oh, that that's new, and it helps me teach or it helps me do my work because again, it's a even if it's a beginner thing, I still don't know everything. So yeah, and, and hearing other people explain things in their own words, even if it's something you're familiar with, especially people that use like really good analogies and things, yeah. you're like, oh yeah, I'm stealing that. That is <laughs> that's a good one. That communicates this so much more efficiently than the way that I would say it. You know what I mean? Right. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you love about animation? Um, you know, so nothing. Truly, nothing. You know what it is? I mm-hmm. I love the pursuit of trying to be a better artist. Right? There's mm-hmm. a million artists that are better than me. There's some that are not like experiences me or whatever but just me versus me last week and then leveling that up what Mm -hmm. I like about animation is that it's a possible avenue to get to that I was talking to to uh, when we were off air you mentioned Dre I was talking to Dre last night Mm -hmm. and I was telling him about a different artistic avenue that I'm in the very like like tiny baby steps of starting to pursue and it's like it's just one of those things where it's like all of these things, whether it's film or games or 2D or 3D or whatever, it's all like just avenues to just try to grow your brain artistically. And that's what I love about it, that it's given me an avenue to have access to people that that know better than me. Mm -hmm. And then I can like learn from those people. And then maybe I can help somebody else too at some point. You know what I mean? And it's like, that's great. That's, That's the one thing I love about it, but it's just a lane for me. That's Mm-hmm. That's it, yeah. So, but there's nothing about it. I'm like, oh, animation's magical. Like, nah, it's, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Speaking to one of the many, uh, you know, ZBrush experts, I feel like the reason, because I've struggled with ZBrush for years, and, you know, I've gotten, I've made inroads. Like, I took a gnoming class uh, a couple years ago and stuff like that, but I'm still not where I want to be. But I think my reason for pursuing is because I've been struggling so much and then I can once I get there I can teach somebody else how to struggle less and and the same thing happened with blender except with blender it was just 2.8 came out (laughs) like before 2.8 it just was like blender was just trash and it's the most counterintuitive thing ever that existed yep yep (laughs) Uh, you know you know but like from 2.8 on you started to see evidence and at least it was this way for me I always knew it was capable of doing a lot, Mm -hmm. even pre Mm 2.8. But now you saw solid evidence where it was like, oh, okay, cool. It's worth the struggle of getting over. Because like, especially if you know, I've I've used Maya for a long time. And for me, Blender is as much about unlearning my Maya habits as it is about learning new habits, you know? And it's like, so it's almost like there's, there's like, there's a deficit that you have to 
fill mm -hmm. because you don't know this thing. But because you know this other way and have all these assumptions about this is the correct way to do it, it could re I've seen so many people, it really gets in your way. And it did for me for a while too. I'm yeah. just now warming up to Blender to where uh, I was in Maya not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And I actually sent a Slack message to a coworker of mine because I was like, oh man, I was just at Maya and I was like, oh, I'm a frozen, like what's happening or whatever. And it was because I was trying to use Blender's navigation. <laughs> and I was like, oh snap, like my brain is really adjusting to, yeah. You know, yeah. But I'd love to leave Maya alone for Blender completely and, and, yeah. and maybe, and maybe ZBrush too, you know? So, yeah. Man, like working in blender like i remember i did a sculpting tutorial and it was before i had a tablet and i was sculpting in blender with a mouse and i was like oh 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 man <laughs> yeah that's crazy <laughs> i was like this isn't yeah. even hard <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but i feel like adult learning in general is a learning i feel like that's why kids can learn so easy because they are like a blank ish slate and with mm -hmm. adults you have to unlearn all the bad stuff and then learn the yeah. thing. And we have a lot of fear where a lot of kids can be fearless. So Yeah. And, but just seeing the number of people who don't necessarily have a, a background at a lot of studios or working on big projects or whatever, and seeing what they're able to do with Blender as hobbyists and yeah. seeing how far they can get. If you take that framework and go, oh, okay, cool. If I take all these little nuggets that I've learned from all these other people I've gotten to work with and I apply those principles to this tool, oh, the, the shortcomings I maybe see in something that somebody else is doing using this tool because of their lack of experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I see enough there where it's like, oh, yeah. if I pick that part up and use that, oh man, it's powerful. So yeah, I would love to use it almost exclusively, but I'm not quite there yet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of the hobbyists, like I remember, uh, I can't remember what year it was, but it was closer to like a 2009, 2010. And I remember, I think it was Blender that the dude used, he was like a, maybe a 15 or 16 year old hobbyist. And he made a hummingbird in Blender. I was like, it was like what? I got a whole degree. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> <laughs> like this man created a realistic, I mean, this teenager created like a realistic hummingbird in Blender. And I'm yep. just like, and yeah. it's, a, it's just a hobby for him. I'm trying to do yeah. this for my life. <laughs> yeah. I, well, see, I, and I think that's the other part too. Like, I think mm -hmm. especially when you're a little younger and, and maybe even a little more insecure about things. I know for me, when I would see stuff like that, it would bother me. Like, mm -hmm. I would just be like, man, what is happening? Like, why aren't I that good? Or why don't I understand how to do this or that or whatever? And after a while, you just learn like, no, 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 it's, 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 a, great that you could be inspired by other people, mm -hmm. but B, nobody knows everything. There's something yeah. you could do better than that person for sure. Right. It's just the thing that they're showing you, they do better than you. And you should just mm -hmm. be like, all right, cool. How do I do that? You yeah. know, it's crazy. Um, so you had <clears throat> this concept called Lunch Crunch. Can you talk mm -hmm. about what that is? Yeah, so Lunch Crunch was really, it came out of when I went into games, it was really a scam. So <laughs> what it was, was I was working with a whole bunch of artists who knew how to make games at a really high level mm -hmm. and had been doing it for a while. And I wanted to learn. So I started documenting my own, like usually in ZBrush, like just, okay, cool. I have my lunch hour. I'm not going to spend it like um, not learning. So mm -hmm. I'm going to learn and do that. And then somebody I worked with, you know, who I really admired was like, oh, I see you always work through lunch or whatever. And I was explaining to him like, yeah, I'm documenting this. I wasn't posting them or anything like that, but I'm, I'm like basically recording what I do. I go back and I look at the recording because ZBrush lets you record little time lapses. Yeah. And I just would look at the time lapse and I would see whatever. At the time, I also, you know, still to this day, I've always been like a huge fan of hip hop, not modern hip hop, sadly. Um, but a lot of like older, you know, like a lot of people in my generation will describe it as like lyrical, spherical, miracle hip hop, like just like <laughs> that kind of that kind of hip hop. So yeah. for me, I would then take those home, those time lapses, and I would put them to music. You know, I only had to find like a one minute clip or two minute clip and I could nice. clamp it to like a one or two minute thing. And then when um, 
when I started to get an online presence, I started posting them. And then a few other people started hanging back at lunch with me and mm-hmm. they started doing stuff. And then it became like a collective kind of thing where we were all comparing what we did and like sharing what we did. And I didn't want the company we worked for to own it. So naive. We were actually using company materials, right? Yeah, but yeah. but so naive to think like, oh yeah, we should start something. So we started a blog on Blogger called mm-hmm. Lunch Crunch and we were posting it. And um, Avalanche was another studio, another game studio. And they had the Avalanche art blog. And I was influenced by that where it's like, okay, we're going to do a 3D version of that. Yeah. And we started mm-hmm. just posting our stuff. And all of a sudden people started following us and we started to get inquiries from the outside. People that work at other companies, hey, can I join this? And yeah. then it grew and it grew to, I think Blogger had a limit of, you can only have a hundred artists. And mm-hmm. in like a year or something, it grew to be about that size. And then we had to move it to another platform and then another platform and another platform until um, uh, someone recommended that we move to Facebook. I moved mm-hmm. it to Facebook and we ended up getting like, like thousands of people. You know, I think at one point, I think our peak was like 30 to 40,000 people, something like that. And it was actually like a big thing. Thinking with my mind now, I would have gone back and monetized it and had merch yeah. and all mm-hmm. this kind of stuff. But I, I was a purist and I was like, no, this is for the art, right? So it's like, yeah, I don't want, I don't want to do any of that scummy stuff. Um, right. Now I do that in a heartbeat. <laughs> but but back, then, <laughs> back then I was like, nah, I don't want to do any of that. Um, when uh, my brother-in-law passed away, uh, mm-hmm. we were on the West Coast and my wife and I are both from New York. We ended right. up moving back to the East Coast so we could be closer to family. Mm-hmm. Um, and the company that I went to go work for basically was like, um, you know, do you own any IP? Do you own whatever? I didn't have any copyright for Lunch Crunch. I didn't have anything. It was just something that I started and did. Um, mm-hmm. And I just mentioned it on the forum. I was like, well, there's a thing called Lunch Crunch, but it's not a conflict of interest because I don't make any money off of it. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't use it that way or whatever. And their legal department was really like, we don't know about this. We don't know about you doing this. You might have to shut this down or whatever. I had just moved my family 3,000 miles across the country. And I was like, I don't want to play. And so I just told everybody on Lunch Crunch, hey, I'm shutting it down and I have a legal thing that I need to worry about or whatever. And the number of people that were just really nasty were that was just like, what do you mean? It's a legal thing. It's a a Facebook page. Like, how could it be a thing or whatever? And I didn't want to explain myself to all these people. So I I actually sat down and I wrote a script, which I didn't Uh know how to do. I looked up some things online and I just I was like, okay. I'm going to give this one shot. If I can yeah. write this script flawlessly to go through, because to to like remove users, you couldn't delete the the board or the page or whatever mm-hmm. until all the users were deleted. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't just shut it down that way. And I had to remove all these people, thousands of people, right. but I could see a list of the people that were on it, a list of their usernames, but I couldn't actually, when you go to like delete people, it only shows you, some ridiculous, like 50 at a time. Yeah, so I was like, yeah. okay, I'm not going to spend a year <laughs> deleting people. So I was like, I'm going to write a script that goes through, parses all the usernames. And then if I run this script and it goes through and deletes all these people, then okay, I'm going to just take that as a sign. I, it, this is what I should do. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it doesn't work and if it gives me any kind of error whatsoever, then there were a couple of people that were asking me, like, can I take it over? Kind of deal. Mm-hmm. I'm going to just go ahead and give it to one of them. So that way I don't have to worry about it, right? Yeah. I, I sat there and one evening, I looked up how to write the script. I mm-hmm. wrote it, I hit enter and all the users were gone. It took overnight to run. And when I got up in the morning, all the users were gone and I was like, all right, it's over. Um, and, and I just stopped it. So, but man, what a mistake that was. I wish I never did that. That was so stupid. Um, mm-hmm. And when I told the lawyers that that's what I did, they then got a little, um, you could see their lawyer brains working. They're like, oh, oh, uh, we, didn't, we didn't actually want you to like do and I was like, this is what you told me. This is what right. you, told me you, wanted, you told me this is a conflict and you weren't sure about it and I might have to get rid of it. I just wanted to remove all doubt and get rid of it. So that's what I did. Mm-hmm. And um, it was, um, it, yeah, hearing him say that was a little bit infuriating, but I was like, you know what? You got to focus on your job and like get this done. Right. So yeah, yeah, just, just huge blunder um, on my part, but you know, you live and you learn. Right. Yeah. Um, You know, know, yeah. 
Um, so, you know, you would use lunch to uh, do some work. I saw you um, mention that um, on so somewhere that like, as far as learning, sometimes people do it at night, but for you, the nighttime is for family and you would do art practice in the morning. So like, what is the importance of family for you? Um, you know, it's weird. Like, you know, I've described to you a little bit, like the, the fracturing of my family, like the way my family is, I have mm -hmm. aunts and uncles and all that stuff that don't talk to each other and whatever. And I'm able to like, sort of move between those groups a little bit and just mm -hmm. have to constantly remind people like, just because I love them doesn't mean I don't love you, you know, like that kind of thing. Right. Um, so that part is a lot. My wife's family is the total opposite. They get mm -hmm. together. It's like super joyous, super loud. Everybody is like getting together or whatever to me is off-putting like I look at it and it's just like I'm aware the logical part of my brain is like no that's life that's what it's supposed to be but mm -hmm. because it's so antithetical to how I grew up I look mm -hmm. and I just go oh man this doesn't feel right and I have to remind myself like no no this is good and this yeah. is how you want your kids to be you don't, right. you want your kids to be like mm -hmm. more like this you definitely don't want them to be like like your family so mm -hmm. to me the importance of family is really like the seeing my kids you know so even before my my wife and I got married mm -hmm. I was in a previous relationship where we raised you know my my old partner's um nephew mm -hmm. we you know it was pretty much the same story that I had it was the same story his mother was also a drug user mm -hmm. his aunt was working I was working we were making decent money and he came to stay with us. So he stayed mm -hmm. with us for like 10 years, you know? Mm -hmm. And so to me in my heart, shout out to Eric, my nephew, Eric, that that's my first son, right? In my mm -hmm. heart, oh, always mm -hmm. and forever. Mm -hmm. And then my wife and I, so he's now, you know, in his thirties and mm -hmm. he's a successful video editor. Um, you know, I never knew he was going to do anything in the arts, you know, but he's a cinematographer, a video editor. Um, he does motion graphics. Like he's just, he's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, and then um, my my oldest son, uh, he's in his early 20s. Um, he is a fireman and mm -hmm. an EMT. My my middle daughter, she's at SUNY Geneseo uh, doing education. Um, she wants to be a teacher. She's been following this like diligently, whatever. And our youngest, she's in high school now, and um, you know she's uh, really into like music and theater and things like that. For me, family at this stage is watching them go from these weird little blobs that don't really have a personality and just sort of follow you around mm -hmm. to each one of them developing their own personalities, their own interests and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, it's beautiful to see, you know? And I think when in a few years, my wife and I are empty nesters, mm -hmm. I think I will be fine. Mm -hmm. I think I have enough interests and all this kind of stuff. I will be fine. I think my wife is going to be a wreck. I think <laughs> family is family is going to change for me again when that happens, because it's going to be a mm -hmm. lot of trying to prop her up and be like, all right, we're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Now right. we can take trips if we want to, you know, so. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but yeah, fam family has been like an evolving thing for me. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, I guess, I guess just, just like unconditional love, you know? Yeah. Like, my kids, I feel like they could come to me with anything. Um, yeah. They could tell me whatever, you know. I, I love a man. I love a woman. I love this. I love that. Whatever. Do, do you think? Like, yeah. as long as you're not hurting yourself or hurting nobody else, do you think? You know, I'm right. for it. You know, so, yeah. That's that's what that's what family is to me now. What would you say is your superpower? And it doesn't have to be, like, animation related. Um, Persistence. I think, I think, and I think you have to have that. I've known so many people who I thought were super skilled in certain areas and they just weren't getting the success nugget at the time that they wanted. And then mm -hmm. they, they stopped, you know? And I think the people who have really endured in these industries in film and games and stuff like that, it's people that have enough of an interest that if you just left them to their own devices, if they were sitting on $10 million and they didn't have to work, they would mm -hmm. still do something artistic in their spare time or whatever. That's what gives you enough interest to like fight through all of the parts that don't work right away. You yeah. know, so I think persistence is probably the only real superpower. And, and, and I think now 
trying to be a sponge, trying to trying to learn as much as I can from other people and be mm-hmm. open to more sources. I, that wasn't always the case for me. I used mm-hmm. to be a little mm-hmm. more closed minded where it was like, oh, this person's got experience. I can learn something from them, but I wouldn't be my my radar wouldn't be as up the same way as someone without as much experience. And I've learned enough from those people over the years mm-hmm. and those people that I'm like, oh, no, it's everywhere. Like, you just got to like keep your ears open for everything. You know, so yeah. What do you feel like most people misunderstand about you? Um, you know what's funny? So Dre and I were talking about this. Mm-hmm. It's um it's confidence. People think that you have worked at a studio or studios or whatever and you have a ton of confidence. And I was telling him last night, there was an old podcast, Clay Cadis uh, used to have a podcast called the Animation Podcast. Mm-hmm. And he has an episode with um, with uh, Glenn Keane on it. And mm-hmm. Glenn Keane, it was the first time I'd heard the term imposter syndrome. Yeah. And Glenn Keane talked about it. And this is like, this is the guy behind Tarzan and mm-hmm. Beauty and the Beast and all of these big movies. And one of the best drafts people, prestige, you know, that kind of thing. And yeah. it's like, he would say, I feel like I'm going to walk in one day and people at Disney are going to be like, hey, we made a mistake. thanks go home you know kind of deal and it gave me permission to feel that a little bit um Mm -hmm. but I think I think something about I don't I don't want to blame it on the pandemic I don't I don't think it's the pandemic but um man this last couple of years confidence has been in the basement you know what I mean I mean I'm literally in my basement but confidence is in the basement like you know just and it's a struggle and I used to be someone that would try to go, try to pay attention to what algorithms are ha- are doing. And, oh, I got to post at least once every three days. And I right. got to post this kind of content. And I got to do this and do that. And at some point, I stopped chasing that. And I thought it was for like more high-minded, kind of like, okay, you're growing out of that phase. But mm-hmm. really, the truth is, I was still making stuff and just not liking any of the stuff that I made and doing a lot of comparison where yeah. it's like, oh, it's not as good as this person's or that person's, or whatever. And man, I think like I'm I've been in a confidence slump. So I think people might think I'm confident, yeah. but I think I think it's doing this now. I think I'm starting to do that a little bit and come back up a little bit because it's that same thing about like the power of not knowing, just being like, it's okay to make something that's not my best thing in the world. It's okay to make yeah. something that's not as good as my digital neighbors, right? It's like but did I learn a thing and did I make something that I like enough? Okay, cool. Don't be afraid, post it, right? Like that kind of thing. And it's like, so really I think confidence is the thing. So I say that really only because Dre mentioned last night when we were talking, you should say something like that when you talk to them because it is good for other people to hear that that's actually a thing, that we go through waves of that kind of thing and it's all right. You know, right. so I think that's that would be the biggest thing, you know. Yeah, I think um, with like posting something and you not liking it. Like I remember I did um, I think I've mentioned this before, but I did like a sculpt timber, which I've never I've never completed any of those art like daily challenges. Like I've done yeah. like five days and then I'm like, all right, because I, I always choose to do it when I'm doing juggling like 12 things. Um, but I remember like a day five was like tiny and. You know, I think I was doing, I was, I had my full-time job and I was doing something else. And so I, I had like to start at like 2 a.m. and be like, all right, let me get, get something out for day five. And I remember I just like, all right, tiny, I'm going to just create a tiny, you know, person, no fe- facial features. And then like up, just a sphere and like the, like the, that sculpture of the dude holding the um, world or whatever. Mm-hmm. I just did like a, bas- <laughs> like a bastardized version of that. And posted it and it got likes like it's like i'm like this is nothing and it, it wasn't anything but it's like even if you think it sucks somebody's still gonna like it <laughs> but but i didn't always believe this but i believe mm-hmm. this now i don't know how you feel about this mm-hmm. but i would hear other artists that were like really more artists with a capital a you know what i'm saying like <laughs> if i do this kind of like i'm a real artist i would hear these kind of people say things like you can transmit joy through art, you can transmit feeling through art or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and what I find is, even if I don't like the result, Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. the, the correlation is not between the result or the amount of time it took me to make a thing or whatever and the number of likes. I find there's a high correlation between I actually had fun doing this little bullshit mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. and other people like it, especially if they can see the process of it. Because yeah. that's the, that's then the part where they tend to like respond a little differently. Yeah. And it's like, man, but this didn't, this other thing took me forever and I really sweated over it or whatever. Yeah. I think they feel that too. And I think they don't like that. They go, oh yeah, I don't want the feeling of hard work. I'm here looking on my mm -hmm. phone or my tablet or whatever. I'm looking for joy. I'm yeah. not looking for anxiety, <laughs> right? And it's like, that's, I think that's maybe the older I get, the more I believe like, oh, I don't know how it works exactly, but I think it's true, you know, yeah, it's crazy. And, and to continue on that, like transmission of joy, particularly for the people who are viewing, that's why I like when every, like not every time, but sometimes when I'm on social media and people comment on how, all right, the people who give the homeless money or they record it and stuff like that. And I'm like, you don't know how alone somebody is in the world that that video of them doing something for someone else can be like, I have faith in humanity now. I, under I understand the other side of like, why mm -hmm. are you recording it? But there's another side of like, people just don't, the people have nobody around them and they don't believe in anything. And sometimes these videos is so that they can believe in something and this, so they can believe in our humanity and so that they can see somebody doing something good for somebody else and get joy from that. So yeah, it, I feel it, like we can do that with our art too. Yeah. Still do the good thing though. Right. It's like, yeah. it's easy to go, Oh, well, yeah, that person's not doing the good thing from a place that I want them to do the good thing from. I want them yeah. to do it for, from a sense of, of charity or giving or whatever. But it's not, it like, if you're still doing the good thing, yeah. for me personally, I'm not going to knock you. Now, if you're giving yeah. that person a sandwich and then you're like, all right, cut, and you snatch back half of the sandwich, <laughs> sorry, yeah. dude, that's horrible, <laughs> don't do that, you know, but still do the good thing. And I think that's that's good enough, you know? So, and additional so. thing like for me is like getting ideas because I remember um somebody did something where it was like a um uh a, a like okay so there's a flash mob right there was like a cash mob where they're like let's show up to this like black owned business and like it was like a beauty supply store or something like that and let's like oh, just spend money yeah. I'm like for me, that I took that, and when I was like president of the Herbal Young Professionals in New Orleans, I was like, that was a. I don't think we ever did it. I think we did it to like a coffee shop, but I wanted to do it on a like continually. But that gave me an idea, like I want to do a cash mob now. Mm -hmm. Like if they had not, never posted that video, then I would have never known that that was a thing. And then I would have never done it with somebody else yeah. else's business. So yeah, it's just very easy to armchair quarterback and dismiss mm -hmm. everything that you see or whatever. And there's a segment of the population that gets off on doing that. That's yeah. fine. That's fine. You know, whatever. But at the end of the day, if you're still doing a good thing in the end, whoever's yeah. in the video, whatever, you could question your motives and this, that, and the third, but it's like what you really do. Because you can have a great heart and good motives and not actually be doing anything for anyone. Or you can have a less great heart and less great motives and still do something and really just be out here searching for likes. Okay, if and that's that what you're doing. that person still ate today. <laughs> yeah, that other person still got something out of it. And if you can be kind in that way, yeah. great. You know, so yeah, it's all good. So what is the key way that you stay relevant in your skills? Like you mentioned that you're trying a new art thing. Like you've learned, you've learned a, a bunch of different things. Like what is the motivation? Like how do you go about it? How do you execute it? Um, I think just trying to improve. Um, so like the, the like we were talking about Blender, the thing that's attractive to me about Blender is that it looks like I can do a lot in fewer moves, right? So mm -hmm. it's like that's really the thing. I have to learn those moves, but you could do a lot in fewer moves. And that's the attractive thing about it. But ultimately, what is that? What is the what is the doing a lot more mean? It means you're getting another art piece out which hopefully has given you one small step up, you know, the stairs of like learning to be a better artist. I, that's really the number one thing for me, right? It's like, if I can learn to be a better artist, like along the way, walk, marching up those stairs, 
whatever helps me in that is is good uh, yeah. mostly it's information like nowadays um the last few years when i've taught online um the thing that i always say especially to intro students is like you guys are taking like classes whether it's at a brick and mortar school or online you're taking these classes there's nothing i'm going to tell you that you can't find for free on youtube right now the only mm -hmm. thing is because you don't maybe have like a ton of experience in a certain area you just look at it as like an overwhelming like amount of information and you don't know how to discern what's necessarily going to be beneficial like yeah. like which videos to watch and i was like but even that you could take a shortcut and you, I'll, I'll tell you you could look up any subject sculpting a head in blender right yeah and you're going to get 100 videos but of those hundred, if you are diligent and say, okay, well, I'm gonna look at the first bunch of them and I'm gonna look up those artists. If you just look at their work and you find their work, the artist whose work that you like that is also sharing their process and information, latch on to them and now follow mm -hmm. that person. You, you will, if you pay attention and practice, you'll get way better at that thing in a very short period of time. When you're, when you're teaching someone all you're really doing is like you're shortening those steps because you are the filter. You mm -hmm. you've done the job of filtering out all the hopefully bad information. You're trying to push good information forward. Um, but there's there's nothing related to our industries right now that I think you can't learn mostly for free. Yeah. And that's that's incredible to me. That because like as, as someone who is around pre-internet. Yeah. It's like, that's insane to me that it's like this now, you know? So yeah, it, whatever gets maybe. me higher mm -hmm. art wise, that's what I want. Maybe I could have been a rigger if all I did, if I had more than the art of rigging book. <laughs> there it is. There it is. I still have that book that's back there somewhere. I still have that book. Yep. Like I made the legs, went to the arms and the legs broke. I was like, I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I still I still have those books. I did all those exercises at one point. At one point, I thought I was going to switch over to rigging. Mm -hmm. um, yep, I did all of those. So you've mentioned it several times. What do you like about teaching? Um, that uh, so I heard a. There's a saying like, um, well, I'll tell you the one that I despise is like those who can't do teach, right? Mm -hmm. But the opposite of that is in order to be able to to in order to know a thing you have to be able to teach the thing yeah and it's like you have to get to the point of proficiency where you can like share some information with someone um you know again I, daily i work with tons of people who are way better than me at like this area or this area or this area or this area and that's great the teaching part is where you get to take all those things that you've learned from those people and you get to share it with somebody else, right? Yeah. And and um, the number of people over the years, in particular, my run at SVA, there were a lot of classes there where a lot of those people have gone on to be professionals and have like really long careers now and that kind of thing. And it's nice to go from being their teacher to, oh, the person that is a little more seasoned than them to like now they got all the seasoning they need and we're peers. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And it's great. That's like a beautiful thing to see. Um, financially is great because it's a nice little side hustle. Right. That is a element to it for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but it's nice because it helps you consolidate your own knowledge. My, my goal, I was teaching at a place called Studio Arts in L.A. Uh, mm -hmm. online. Um, and my goal now is to get proficient enough with Blender that I can teach all the things that I would normally teach for them in Maya and, and ZBrush and just have a blender class that teaches those things. Um, yeah. So that's that's what I'm working on right now. And I told them like, I'm taking a few years off. Thankfully, like usually they'll have a spot if I say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in teaching again. They usually have like a, a spot or something come for something coming up. And my goal is like to go back to them with that and say, okay, this is the new tool in the tool belt. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I wanna do. So, yeah. Yeah. I feel like for me with teaching, particularly currently um, teaching like introduction to 3D modeling in Blender and introdu introduction to 3D animation in Blender, which I'm more of a modeler than I am here. <laughs> shit, shit, I'll, I'll, take your, I'll take your class for sure. I was just about to say, you should come <clears throat> over and steal, steal all my stuff. stuff. But um, I'll do it. 
I welcome you too, because like, ain't, ain't no reason for me to keep all the information. And so like, I feel like a, th a big thing for me in anything, whether it's teaching or anything, something I realized that with going through all these like professional development programs when I lived in New Orleans is like, I remember I did this one thing where it was like an education accelerator and we were, um, uh, I wasn't at the head of it, but I was like helping them uh, get STEM professionals to teach in um, or to kind of do presentations in the New Orleans schools or whatever. And I remember our coach, like she was like, she had like an education uh, business, but I'm like the other person got all the information. <laughs> Cause like she helped us with the beginning, but as we like had to do other stuff, she was not able to like tell us anything. And I remember writing down all the stuff and I'm like, all right, when we get the little survey at the end, I'm going to like tell them <laughs> about this. And we never got a survey. And I feel like evaluation is so important. And so in my classes, the like the, in the final weeks, like if it's a 12 week class and like week 10 or something like that, when I signed the final project, I put like a reflection discussion for them to tell me what can I improve on? And, you know, when I started at this school in the summer, they told me a bunch of stuff and I approved it for the fall. And then like the fall one, it was like, all right, some of these are like, yeah, like y'all have to improve. On. <laughs> it's not really about me. But even then I'm like, all right, y'all want to see other people's work. I can make it extra credit if you post your work every you know week you can get 50 points extra credit so i can't force people to share their work i only teach on zoom for an hour because it's a hybrid online class so like i can only i don't i, I need that time to demonstrate and all that stuff but if y'all want to see each other's work here's extra credit i still can't force y'all to do it but I, I feel like evaluation is so important because how can i get better if i think i know everything and i'm thinking i'm teaching y'all everything that you need to know and even self-evaluation sometimes i'm like oh i threw everything in the kitchen sink at them let me dial it back <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i i'll tell you oh one education thing my last time doing physical classes it was like a year or so before the pandemic i live about mm -hmm. four hours north of new york city mm -hmm. and SBA had a class they wanted me to teach, but I don't live in the city anymore. So I was like, well, I could do it online. They didn't want to do it online. They wanted to protect their status as a brick and mortar school. And I was yeah. like, all right, here's what it would cost for me to teach this class um, every week. And it involved them paying for my train, for mm -hmm. gas. So, so the full round trip was like four and a half hours each way. Yeah. And then doing a doing two, three hour sessions in the middle. So it was like a whole day from like early in the morning all the way to late at night with yeah. everything. So I quoted them a ridiculous number and they were like, yeah, we'll give it to you. And I was like, holy smokes, okay, cool. <laughs> so I started doing it and I tried to use my time going down there on the train, uh, taking an Amtrak down there mm -hmm. um, to like draw and like do stuff and like learn. And, you know, it was actually a pretty good situation while it lasted. Yeah. One, one of the semesters that I was there doing that, um, there were a few students who just, I was like, why are you taking this class? You're, they were largely disruptive. They mm -hmm. were um, just not into the material at all. And you had yeah. other people in the class that were really, really into it. And, um, um, you know, so that semester ends, those people fail. And mm -hmm. then when we get to uh, the next semester, we get a new batch of students or whatever. And then I had announced like, this is gonna be my last one for a while. Cause the commute on every Saturday was getting to me. So I was like, yeah. all right, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop this, you know, but this is my last semester doing it. And I'm going through the role the first day. <clears throat> and one of the people in there was one of the students that was super disruptive. Yeah. And I couldn't believe it. So I had a talk with her after class and I was like, Hey, why are you taking this class again? And she told me straight up, you know what? I fell in with the wrong crowd. And mm. I, I basically, I felt like I let you down and I went home, I told my parents about it, how you were like the most prepared of our teachers, you like had your stuff ready, you were always there, whatever, and how you were really trying. And I really felt bad about the way it went. Yeah. So my parents made me get a job to pay for this course. So I paid for it again or whatever. And we went through, she was there first every mm -hmm. week. 
she busted her butt or whatever. And I get I get misty now thinking about it. Like yeah. at the end at the end of the class, it was the last day of the year, and I'm ending up talking to her in class. And we had to go off to the side, and I cried a little bit talking to her. I was like, "Hey, listen, I never had an experience like this. Like you mm-hmm. made this really like my favorite semester ever. Like you made this great or whatever." And like just I think about I think about her a lot when I am failing at a thing mm-hmm. yeah because it reminds me you can you can fall down and you can get right back up like you can 100 yeah. percent do that that's okay you know but I, I think about her a lot that's like one of my favorite education things sorry I went yeah. on a weird thing no. but it popped in my head yeah the I feel like the other takeaway is that you were who you needed when you were like you were the, the teacher that you remembered <laughs> like Maybe, you just, maybe you didn't want to disappoint that one teacher each year, and that was who you were for her. Maybe, maybe I never thought about definitely it that way. Maybe, not maybe, definitely, because yeah, she went crazy. home and talk, she went home and talked to her parents and about how much yeah, she disappointed yeah. you. Like that, you were that literally was that person. That was such a good group of people, man. It was such a good group of people. It's, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, that's what's crazy. up. That and that's that's a testament to how good you are as a teacher. And you learned from the people who gave that to you. Yeah, hopefully. Even if it was through osmosis or innately and you didn't even realize it, but it still is there. Mm-hmm. What do you feel is like the importance of incorpor- incorporating your culture into projects when given the opportunity? Um, So it's weird. I've been on a few different projects now where I definitely have light privilege, 100%. I've been in rooms and and whatever where people are unaware of my ethnic background or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure after getting to know those people a little bit that mm-hmm. if I was as dark as one of my cousins or even my wife, I, I'm not sure I would get in that room. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's like that's that's just real. Yeah. Um even even, you know, so for me, I say that to say, yeah, there there have been a ton of situations. Um like when I was at Netflix, for example, I was on a small team working on a bunch of different projects. Yeah. And one of the things that I noticed on a couple of the projects was when people do find out about my heritage or background, they start running things by you <laughs> kind of deal. How do you feel about this? Or what do you think about this or whatever? And that's mm-hmm. happened at a few studios in a few different situations. Um, and it's like a weird thing where it's like, you know, nobody is a monolith, right? You know, if I went to you and asked you, hey, how do white people think about this? That's not, you can't answer that. You know what I'm saying? I can give you my, and I always try to preface it with like trying to give you my personal opinion. That said, that said, particularly in games, there have been a bunch of situations, especially when you're working on assets that are player facing, that the player is going to identify as or whatever. And it's like, you know, you throw just some bullshit sphere on there and be like, Afro, you know, or or you represent like, you know, like hair texture is like a huge one, but you represent things where it's like, okay, facial features is another one. And I saw this a lot in animation as well, where it's like you're working on generic characters for film X. Mm -hmm. Well, there has to be a spread. There has to be a range of Mm -hmm. the base shapes that you use for that that observe different ethnic things that we see in people right and it's like i think the default is usually you know um caucasian male caucasian female Mm -hmm. and then various shades of brown of that same asset and it's like no no we could we could put a little more care into that Mm -hmm. there have been times i think i've been like it's like if i was on the outside looking in and i couldn't be in that room Mm -hmm. i think there have been times where they would have been like yeah keep that door closed keep him outside but now i'm already in the room so i do get to say the thing and it's like damn he's in here and he said it out loud you know what i mean it's (laughs) like that's the that's the crazy that's the crazy part um so i think like making sure especially where there's going to be people looking at things to see themselves to me that's the part where it's like okay you have to make sure that you have a good enough representation of yeah. certain things and it, and it's crazy because you hear a lot of complaints about like you know um 
wokeness and this and that or whatever. Mm -hmm. For for me personally, this is my personal thing. I think that term has been completely co-opted. Yeah. And I think it doesn't mean what people are trying to make it mean right. when they when they use it in a certain way. But I think the original, as I understand it, the original context of having an awareness and making sure you're not taken advantage of is still the way I use it. And that's the way I see it. There will be other people that go, oh, it's budgetarily more efficient if we just brown up the two mm -hmm. white characters. So let's not be so woke and this and that and blah, 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 blah. But it's very easy to push back on, like really easy to just yeah. say, hey, hey, you know what? we should have this kind of representation. And then, especially because you have a little bit more technical acumen, you can mm -hmm. say, we have the topology to support it. It doesn't take long to do. Here, yeah. look, I even did it already. I had to do that at one point. Here, look, yeah. I even did it already. It's actually done. And it morphs into everything that we have for every character. And all you're doing is rearranging facial features. That's really it, all right? Yeah. And it's like the bodies can stay the same, the animation can stay the same. There's nothing about this that's going to hurt or change or whatever. And once you do that, and there's no monetary thing attached to it, once mm -hmm. you have removed that, mm -hmm. now it's just people, if you have an objection, I'd like to hear what it is. You know what I mean? And it's like, I'd like to hear where that objection comes from, because it's like you've removed all the bullets from their gun. Um, all right. So I think it's important um, to, to have people that care about that, at least you know, or have an awareness that it's something to care about. Because I think there's a lot of people that don't have any malice whatsoever that are just on autopilot going, oh, yeah, this is how we do it. And yeah. um, it's like, nah, there, there's other ways to think about this stuff. So I think that's yeah. important. That's been important for me throughout my career, you know. Yeah. Um, and then I had one weird case. I don't want to name the, the show or whatever, where it was the opposite. It mm -hmm. was like, it was... Um, did you see um, American Fiction by chance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right. So no spoilers. You can see this in the trailers if anybody's watching this. The basic premise of like, like you know, there's a there's a line. I don't know if we need to cut this, but there's a line where it's like, oh, listening to Black voices is so important. And it's like, yeah. this is the white people not listening to the two Black people in the room. <laughs> and it's like, it's it's a hilarious moment. I had that on a show where they went the opposite. All of the mm -hmm. showrunners and everything were all Caucasian people, very well-meaning, very, mm -hmm. you know, like just, hey, I don't, I don't believe these people have a hurtful bone in their body. Right. They went the other way. They went where it was like, oh, yeah, we just going to give everything the biggest lips, the widest noses, the, you know, whatever. And it was just like to where it became such a caricature where it's like this coming from you has actually sort of crossed over into being a little bit offensive. Yeah. And having to have that conversation was super difficult. And I struggled with it because I was like, do I say something? I feel right. like I need to say something. And by the mm -hmm. time I actually said it, it was zero pushback. They were actually who they were showing me they were. They were like, you know what? We need to think about that. We're going to do another pass. Great. Cool. And it was like, got it back to a place where it was like, okay, yeah, you represent, but it's not a crazy yeah. car cartoonish mm -hmm version of what you because you could go too far the other way but i've only had that part once usually it's the other way just struggling to get included is yeah that's yeah and that and that's that's what's crazy about like getting the gumption to mention something and they're just like oh okay yeah <laughs> yeah i can see that <laughs> I was going through all of these gymnastics in my head. Like, I know they're trying to do a good thing and I don't want to push yeah. them off of that square. So how do I say something or whatever? And when I finally said it, they were totally cool with it. And it was like, all right, cool. You know, I built it up in my head to be bigger than it was, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, about the woke thing. Like I was, um, I'm in the, if, if anybody wants to go see, I'm in the comment section of like Disney's post of Awaju because there was like a bunch of people in there like, <clears throat> oh, this is woke. Da, 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 da. And I'm just like, so how would it give me an example of how it would not be woke but it still include people who don't look like you and they can't mm. ever answer the question because it's like yeah. you're just saying it's woke because it has black people in it or hispanic people in it and that's it and they're like oh but you know they've done <clears throat> woke stuff before and it's like 
But is, no. is it woke though? Is, or is it I, just inclusive of other people? <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you the one that gets me. Mm-hmm. You have people, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember, I think it was Jamie Foxx was mm-hmm. playing Daddy Daddy Warbucks or whatever in like the reboot of Annie. Yeah, and there yeah, were a yeah. bunch of people like, Annie's white, Annie's white, you know, in the comics and the old movie and whatever. And I'm like, Annie is fictional. <laughs> you have gods of Egypt and it's like, you know, every like British actor, right? <laughs> is is there and i'm like i'm fairly certain none of these people are from <laughs> egypt but it goes back like elizabeth taylor playing you know yeah you know playing um uh man i'm blanking uh but anyway. uh cleopatra or something like that cleopatra or... yeah i kept yeah. wanting to say nefertiti but it's Cleopatra. yeah <laughs> but but basically it's the same it's the same sort of thing where it's like you can't have this selective outrage like so woke and cancel culture is something that you hear and i'll just put it in these terms you know, people on the far right, you know, Mm -hmm. oh, well, this wokeness and this cancel culture is out of control. Tell that to the Dixie Chicks. Tell that to, (laughs) tell that to Disney. Tell that to all of the people that you want to boycott. This is Mm -hmm. not new. This is new terminology, but people have always voted with their dollars. People have always voted with their dollars. It is that simple. Tell tell that to the dude you remember the dude who was running for president and he was like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah he was gone. He was gone just based off of that. I was like, yeah, that was, that was, what is it, Howard Dean? I think it was Howard Dean. Yeah, yeah. The, Wah! Yeah, that he was crazy. That was culture. Like, that man just yeehaw. And y'all were like, yeah. No. yeah, it wasn't the right, it wasn't the right tone of yeehaw. The, the thing is, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, people will always vote with their dollars. But this, you know, our country has a long history of like, you go back and you look at like, you know, McCarthyism, for example, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's Mm -hmm. like, oh, we think this person is not the kind of person that we want to support. We don't want them to have a career. We don't want them to do this. You can attach whatever label you want to it. You can attach Mm -hmm. wokeness to it. You can attach communism to it. You can attach whatever, like all throughout our history, it actually is operating on both sides. And it's just funny to me when I hear people on either side complain about that particular aspect because yeah. it's been around forever this is not new <laughs> they just put a new label on it it's, it's right in there yeah it's crazy mm-hmm. yeah. Like, to go back to um calling people out um like yeah like my you know my interviews are important but something i liked about talking to the camera at the beginning of my youtube channel was was like doing just that like i remember when i had the video about the princess tiana thing where they like changed her to like like skin with curly hair mm-hmm. and you know, I use the example of like, you know, the the um the villain from Hotel uh, Trans- Transylvania and his like black suit. Like, if you can have a black suit in animation, you can have a black person. <laughs> like, oh, we can't light it because I was like going doing research about, and it was uh, mostly people who were not in the animation industry or just like didn't have that knowledge base to know. Like, oh well, maybe she was too dark to, and it's like if you can have things that are the color black, like blackity black. You black, can have black, yeah. a dark skinned person, and mm-hmm. there's and in the video, I was like, There's a thing called light linking, you can just put a light on her and it affects nothing else. Like, yeah, this is not a valid reason, yeah, so. yeah, it's it's really insane, you know. And and yes, I can understand maybe closer to like the dawn of computer graphics, yeah, you having certain challenges that you could maybe even have some actual technical validity in saying this is more challenging than that right we've far exceeded that threshold in terms Mm -hmm. of like what we're capable of doing it 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 doesn't make sense anymore to have anything like that so yeah that's Mm -hmm. my thought anyway and you mentioned the like video game avatars like i have had a um a couple friends that i've talked to in in the past week because that conversation has circled back because their people are complaining like so not every black dude has the killmonger dress (laughs) yeah that's what it is about them where if they if if like you can advocate for more representation but they're gonna take that one thing and run it back (laughs) well it's it's a it's a proven technical because like it is it is if you think about what it is to Mm -hmm. represent afrocentric hair for example Mm -hmm. it is more complex and more challenging than hair that clumps together like that right so the whole thing is really just how can you organize the clumps into readable masses 
If you have straighter hair, typically you see that in people and it's like, okay, you can see the organized clumps. When you have hair that doesn't organize into clumps, like by default that way, it's mm -hmm. much more difficult to represent in an economical way. That Killmonger, like faux dread comb over, that shit right there is just literally, oh, we could make clumps. Got you. <laughs> And that's really all it is. It's just about like the technology of clumping the hair. Um, one of the, I can't say much about the project I'm on now. One mm -hmm. of the people that I work with, um, who's like the lead of our group, uh, shout out to Lucas. He is a tremendous artist and he went through great pains to uh, represent hair um, of all different types in what I think is one of the most thoughtful ways that I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like super happy and proud to see that that was a thing, you know, that was actually really cool. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. What do you hope for the future of animation as far as like innovation, storylines, characters? Um, well, I hope that it's still around. Uh, AI is real. Um, mm -hmm. I think all of this stuff, like from a business standpoint, boils down to it's all speculation, just like any other investment. You get people yeah. that invest in a project for every dollar they invest, they hope to get back more than a dollar, right? Mm -hmm. So you want the projects to be successful. If people have to invest less dollars in the initial upfront cost of the venture, then the venture, the, the venture has a better chance of making more money later. And mm -hmm. that simple metric, we could argue all day about like AI being soulless or theft or this or that. The mm -hmm. fact is, from a business standpoint, people are going to continue to try it because it requires less capital investment in the beginning, and you have a better chance to get money back at the end as a business mm -hmm. pursuit. I yeah. do think that you know some of it will go away. Um, mm -hmm. I, I saw one of my friends um, sent me an article the other day from the Animation Union. I don't know if you saw this about like which jobs will AI replace or whatever. Mm -hmm. And modeling was one of the first ones that like, and it's like talking to people about what you think the perception is. They're like, oh, modeling is going to go, you know? And I think personally, what we make, when we make a game or we make a film, we make sequential images in the end. Yeah. The whole thing about making a 3D object and then lighting that 3D object and, you know, doing all the things you need to do to make it move around in space to give you the perception that there's depth there. We have to do a lot of steps with a lot of people usually to get that all working, even yeah. in the most efficient pipeline. And I think the real threat of AI is going to be that someone's able to say, give me dancing coffee cup. And once we get to the point where the editing of that is easy, where it's mm -hmm. like, okay, not that dance or not that exact coffee cup. And you mm -hmm. can iterate and get good, predictable, solid results. And we're not there yet. Where yeah. you, when you can get that, and, and now the number of people that are required to make this thing that looks like it has depth, because mm -hmm. again, we flatten everything out. We make sequential images in the end. Mm -hmm. So basically, sadly, I think where we're headed is not that modeling will get replaced or that concept will get replaced or mm -hmm. any of these individual departments. I think the whole shebang is going to get replaced because mm -hmm. in the end, the business aspect of like making this thing that is a series of sequential images that is directable. And we've seen already with music, as much as we would hope that the consumer would care yeah. where, where it comes from and how it's made, they don't care. We've we see it now with music. They don't care. They just yeah. want entertainment, you know? So I think at some point, I don't know if it's a year or five years or 10 years, I don't know when it's coming, but at some point the option to do that will be there. And I think it will have a tremendous impact. So my hope is that it still exists, but uh -huh. they still make stop motion movies. They still make 2D movies. They still make whatever. Yeah. It's just the number of people that get to contribute to that is very small. And I was telling you earlier, like in talking uh -huh. to Dre, I'm pursuing new artistic avenues. That is in part because I want to get through the struggle of learning those artistic avenues now. Yeah. Then if there's no place for me in five years, right, in, mm -hmm. in this industry, 
okay, well, I've had five years of learning to do this other thing that I can transfer to, and that becomes the avenue for artistic expression right. and not, not animation anymore or not games anymore. I don't think it'll ever go away completely. Yeah. But I think, I think um, you know, just looking at the tea leaves, people are really going to try it. People are really going to try and save mm -hmm. money by doing it. And I hope they fail miserably to the point where they go, all right, fine, we need people. Right? Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. So I just hope it's there, you know. Yeah, I've been talk talking for years about, you know, the Issa Rae effect. Like, I, you know, since I was watching her on, uh, do you do awkward black girl like you know because even people you know my age and younger even though we have access to all these things it's still like this old school mentality of pitching and all this stuff and I'm like but look at what Issa Rae did and now that it's circling back where she's like there are no smart executives I'm because I I've been, for the past several years I've just <clears throat> had this hope in the indie industry that has not been realized or executed. And I just like, maybe she will be the rejuvenation of what I've been talking about her doing for, you know, decade where she's yeah. like, I'm gonna go independent because I'm wondering if, you know, to, to add into the conversation of what you're talking about of like, may, maybe I'm seeing the audiences get this fatigue of seeing the same stories over and over again. And that human element is what makes stuff different. And then that representation is what makes stuff different. But it's like indie, indie people that like, it's like, they just want to pitch to a big company. And it's like, just if y'all could just do it yourselves and yeah. you know, black Americans are like, according to how much we spend we're like the fifth or sixth largest country in the world if y'all could just tap into black dollars in some way and and then if you just because if you own it directly that's why i follow like kev on stage and stuff like that mm -hmm. to see if you build a community that's the big thing about his success the community that he's built and the idea of like a thousand true fans you can make less money <laughs> because yeah. you don't have to you don't have to give it to so many people yeah. Um, I'm talking about the, the executive, <laughs> not, not the not the people making it. I'm talking about the people like the dish, <clears> you know, <throat> all the all the money grab people, not the mm -hmm. actual people making it. You give the money to the people making it. But I'm just I'm just like I just want the ind independent animation ecosystem to be way more than it is. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we're always behind music, right? And and yeah. music music is typically 10, 15, 20 years sometimes ahead of where we are. Yeah. And uh, Dre and I were talking about this last night when mm -hmm. I was growing up right like half of my life ago the typical thing was oh Danny Danny has a band Deb is an A&R at a, mm -hmm. a, a record company mm -hmm. she's gonna go out see Danny perform mm -hmm. and look at the crowd look at the merch if mm -hmm. all these things check the boxes oh yeah he's got a fan base and I think the potential is there I could see this record selling the last thing I have to have to bring to the table for you to give me a deal is I have to have a demo that needs very little polish because mm -hmm. you don't want to go sinking thousands of dollars into setting me up and then not being able to get some return on that later on. Yeah. If my demo is really polished and you can go ahead and press that up and just maybe do a little mixing or whatever, and mm -hmm. I have all those other elements, you're set. Yeah. SoundCloud and all this stuff comes around. And now you don't have to come see me. I put my mm -hmm. stuff on SoundCloud. You can see my followers. You can see how many people have downloaded and streamed and done all this mm -hmm. stuff, whatever. You can see everything there as data and you know, oh, okay, cool. This person is going to move units, yeah. right? And the quality is the quality. You see what it is. There's no vetting of the quality. You see what it is. I might need to do stuff to it, but basically now, Deb is a middle person is out of work because she can't be A and R anymore. Deb yeah. the exec, Deb the executive is who I'm talking to directly. There's yeah. no more middleman. That's what I think we're seeing with you mm -hmm. know not just Issa Rae, but I think there are a few like you mentioned. Kev on stage is one. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Big Ja, all of these people mm -hmm. that actually have these, and yeah. and they're doing it. They're doing it right. They're building up groups, and they're doing exactly what those people did. Because having that group, for better or worse right now, that's the leverage for everything that you do. Because mm -hmm. that's how other people look at you now and go, 
hmm, if I give you a dollar, I can get back a dollar fifty, right? Yeah. And like that's the leverage. And it's like so building up that group. Um, and I say all that to say, I was an idiot for getting rid of Lunch Crunch. So <laughs> there you go, <laughs> there you go. So there it is. Sadly. And the thing is, it's like that in parts of the animation industry right now, whether people know it or not. Like if you go pitch and you don't got IP or a following, mm -hmm. we don't care. Yeah. Yeah, it could <laughs> you be already like, got it could, like people. It could be it could be the greatest story in the world. Or or you have someone on the inside. That's the other yeah. way I've seen it work, where it's mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, yeah, I know this person. They've climbed up the ladder a little bit. And yeah. I'm not going to be able to probably leapfrog them on the ladder, but maybe mm -hmm. they could put a hand down and I could get like a few, maybe I could taste the bottom of their shoes on this ladder. <laughs> you know, it's like that's Maybe I could do that. You yeah. know? So, yeah. Um, I saw you answer this question um, on uh, somewhere else. So you had answered um, hip hop or rap and you said hip hop. What do you feel like is the difference between hip hop and rap? I think the mumbody fumbody stuff that you have right now is rap. That's right. Mm -hmm. I think, um, and I'm not like a complete purist where it's like hip hop yeah. is the five elements and it's the MC <laughs> and the DJ and the breakdance. Like I'm not, I'm not doing all of that, right? <laughs> but, but I will say that to me, um, hip hop music has intrinsic value that goes beyond whatever the current trend is, yeah. right? There are some things, and I'm also not a person that down. There are are relatively new artists that I think are good artists that I will listen to 100%. It really is just about the validity of the music to me, right? Yeah. You can't tell me, like right now, if you go listen to Coast Country, you can't tell me that's not great. And you can yeah. say, oh, but they're really boom babby, so it's like old hip hop or whatever. That's fine. If mm -hmm. I listen to, to J.I.D., mm -hmm. all right, cool. Jade is great, great, right? I can't say anything bad about, but, but also, he is incorporating like new flows, new yeah. sounds, new whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's not just rallying against the sound. It's, am I going to be able to listen to this a year from now, six months from now, without just whatever is going on currently yeah. and, and appreciate it and still listen to it? It's not disposable. That's yeah. the part for me that I really think. So that's why I say hip hop over rap. Like for mm -hmm. me personally, rap is disposable. Hip hop is like, Oh yeah, you can listen to that later on and still pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So what do you hope, you know, animation professionals are doing in this current landscape that you wish you could have done when you were younger or that you wish you could do now or that you are doing now? Don't over specialize. Um, mm -hmm. So you want to work at Studio X and they make this kind of product and their workflow is that you have to be doing this. That might be what you need to do to get into that company. And certainly you want to prove you have those skills. So they hire you. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, I think when I see people who proclaim, like you'll see it on art station all the time, like, you know, 3d hard surface artists, you know, mm -hmm. 3d hard surface weapon artists, you know mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and it's just like being so super specific. And it's like, again, art is like a really big umbrella. And even yeah. if your interest only pushes you to one small narrow sliver of that umbrella, there are going to be other things. You look at the best, like I keep saying hard service, but you look at the best hard service artists and you mm -hmm. hear them talk about like who they're inspired by or what they're inspired by. You look at the best like people in fashion or whatever, their, their interest is not just other hard service artists or other fashion people. Their mm -hmm. interests are, oh, I saw a canopy of trees and that made me think about the shapes and want to get this in this particular fashion piece or whatever. And it's like, it, art is everywhere. How we see things yeah. is very particular to artists for us to digest and like put back out. So mm -hmm. even if right now your interest is so narrow, maybe invest a little bit wider and then only at work, that's the expression that you choose, right? And it's like, that's cool. But at some point, if you do anything long enough, you're going to mm -hmm. get interested in something else give yourself a wide like like what you take in keep that part really wide and then as you start to branch out and go man i've been doing weapons and i'd like to do characters more well you've yeah. been observing and figuring out how you want to do that later and then you can go try to do that you know and you're not starting from scratch right yeah. so it's like 
don't let the industry dictate how narrow your artistic lane is, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And that's why I've continued my struggle with ZBrush because, you know, I am a hearse yeah. modeler, but I do want to do characters and I have a lot of ideas and not necessarily do characters for a studio. I want to do characters for myself. What three movies do you, or TV shows, do you recommend to my audience and why? And it doesn't have to be animation. Um, let's see. Um, so I'll go, I'll go movies, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. I'll say one that has fallen by the wayside over the years. Watch The Iron Giant. <laughs> Um, the Iron Giant is a tremendous movie. It used to be my favorite animated anything. And then Spider-Verse came out. And then the second Spider-Verse came out. Um, you know, so uh, those have overtaken it. But um, yeah. yeah, The Iron Giant is one for sure. Um, and it's not really... So <clears throat> another another thing I would recommend, it's kind of a broader category but watching other people talk about how passionate they are about almost anything, but in particular about art. Yeah. If you have if you have Disney Plus, for example, and I have no affiliation with Disney, mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of um, there's a couple of things on there. One is about two artists, um, Afton Corbin and Luis. I don't remember his last name. Um, Gonzalez. Gonzalez, yeah, and them making their short mm -hmm. films um, at Pixar and following them through making their, their so for me i'm a nut for stuff like that where it's like yeah. oh i can see the thought process behind this thing and it's not just a behind the scenes you, you they actually show you those two people struggle and struggle with like their personal identity and how they get yeah. the film done and how they communicate with other people all these things that you really need i like i like that kind of stuff so anything that's like more than just like regular BTS that's like, you know, just um, or behind the scenes, whatever, mm -hmm. that, that talks more about emotion related to the process and not just the process. I'm a yeah. sucker for anything like that. Um, and then I'm trying to think, there's so many things I like. It's insane. I'm trying to think of what the right thing is. I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it at those two. Okay. Those are the two, yeah. To speak to the uh, the second point, because um, I say it behind the scenes, but I guess I'll say it for public consumption. I feel like my t one of my takeaways from watching the ILM documentary mm -hmm. was, okay, so you know, when we talk about DEI, diversity, da 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 they're like, you know, meritocracy, like it should be the people who are qualified and all this stuff. My takeaway from watching the ILM documentary, them people was talented, but they were not qualified. <laughs> like, they failed their way through that Star Wars movie. Like when when George Lucas came back from England or something and he was pissed, like mm -hmm. those were highly talented people, but they didn't know what they were doing because it was new. Mm -hmm. But there's no way they could be qualified. So when people talk about being qualified, it's a sham. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it can be. I think I think the thing is, I think I take umbrage with Mm -hmm. the assumption that because someone is X, yes. that they're automatically not qualified. That's really that's the main, that's the yeah. main thing for me. And mm -hmm. it's like, you know, so. Um, and the, and the assumption that because the people who have gotten the opportunities over and over again, have gotten the opportunities that they're qualified. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily I work, that either. Yeah. I worked with someone um, who, you know, I was I, years, many, many years ago, I was in a meeting. We mm -hmm. wanted to hire someone who had worked with us before. And we also had someone that probably was going to leave the company because they couldn't get promoted. And we all sat down, you know, I was like one of the senior members of the team. We all sat down, we looked at the, the qualifications for the person we were talking about hiring. And I was like, wait, but this other person that we know is probably going to leave, they're here. They're really good. I think they're at least as good as this person. They know yeah. exactly, you know, that they fit. Like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? And why are we trying to, like, get this other person back when we should probably put our effort into doing that? I was able to convince a few people that person got promoted into our senior leadership and mm -hmm. they stayed. And we worked together for a really long time. 
Mm -hmm. still to this day are like really good friends. I'm glad that that happened or whatever. Yeah. Fast forward a few years later, we have sort of different leadership in that group. There's actually the person I'm talking about, she, um, she, she's also from Louisiana. She mm -hmm. was working with us for a while, you know, really, really skilled person at that point, really good. And I heard someone in a meeting, they were talking about promoting someone else is very similar kind of thing who had yeah. been asking for a promotion, who was also very good, but hadn't been with us as long as long. Mm -hmm. And there were some things said in the meeting that really, it wasn't as direct as saying, well, this is a woman. You know, yeah. and there was nothing about it that it was that related to her being black. But I think that there was a subtext there as well. Yeah. And I tried the logic route again and say, well, she's been here longer. She's done this much work. She's done whatever, mm -hmm. like all checks, all the boxes on paper. And what I got told was now we've really been pushing for this guy because he's been asking for a long time. So we've mm -hmm. already pushed this through, basically, like this is not a discussion. This is happening. Yeah. And I was like, but we're leapfrogging this other person. And yeah. I was really mad about it. And I went and talked to her about it and said, listen, you need to know this is what's happening mm -hmm. um, behind the scenes. I'm trying to advocate for you, whatever. And she was like, stop, don't do that. She's like, I'm moving. And she was moving from New York back to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, now that I know, I know, right? But mm -hmm. before that, it was like, so that's one of the most egregious things I've seen because what was said in a meeting out loud was, oh yeah, this person is... Uh, uh, you know, just had a kid and all this. And I'm yeah. like, that has, but that has no bearing. That has no, right. that, that has not affected their work. That has not mm -hmm. done anything. Like if you say, since she had the kid, these bad things have happened, right? right. She's late or doesn't do her work well or the quality slipping or whatever. Okay. Now you can have a discussion about put the potential for those two things to be related, but to be mm -hmm. like, we can't offer her a promotion because she had a kid was insane to me. Yeah, it's, it's one of the reasons I left that company. It, it's insane to me. I was like, yeah, this is this is wild. So, yeah, sucks. I had somebody in the past week or two reach out to me to um, to talk to me because they're in Canada. They work at a, a studio and they're like um, oh, they're a woman and they're like tired of seeing like the same dudes get hired. Like, how can I advocate and all this stuff? She was like kind of looking to me for some like advice. And I remember something she said was like that they, you know, some guys say to combat, which I've never, I'm like, is this a Canadian? I've never heard this thing, but they're like, oh, women don't work as hard. Like, Whoa. what? Whoa. <laughs> what? I, what? I, I, in America, I ain't never heard that nobody say that. They said some things about, oh, you, you know, if you, if it's like a, um, like a, uh, like a trade job, like, oh, think she can't lift stuff, or like, all, all the things. I ain't never heard nobody say, no, women don't work as hard. <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's wild. That's wild. I mean, but the fact that those ideas are still pervasive and whatever, yeah. if you can look on paper and you can say, you know what, this person objectively, or I guess it's maybe subjective when you talk about art, this yeah. person subjectively, I like their art better than their art. Mm -hmm. If you can do that from a pure place, and you can say, I think this person can help us more. And mm -hmm. the person that can help you more is whatever, white yeah. male, white female, black mm -hmm. male, black female, you mm -hmm. know, Latin, whatever. Mm -hmm. If that person can help you more, to me, that is the number one metric. So when people yeah. talk about like fairness and the assumption of like, like, you know, meeting a certain standard, that's the standard. The standard is, can this person help me? You know what yeah. I mean? Like that's, can, can they help us get the job done? And if that person happens to be this or that, okay, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I do understand that a company's perspective or hiring manager's perspective might not be, oh, I'm aware that there are systemic inequalities. Mm -hmm. And they might say, but it's not up to me to fix that or change that by hiring a person that I feel like is less qualified. I think they have their job is to get qualified people into the mm -hmm. workplace. I understand that there are systemic inequalities. And in my personal opinion, as long as that person is judging for who helps us the most, then yeah. that's that's who should win. Now, if that person happens to be someone that does not look like you, you should still give them the job.
right? You should still, if that person doesn't look like you and you feel like they are the best fit, most qualified, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like, I, I do believe in that. Um, and I think most marginalized people, in particular, a lot of the women that I've worked with over the years, mm-hmm. what I've noticed is, it's wild to say, oh, they don't, they don't do as much or don't work as hard or whatever, because they're dealing with so much stuff all yeah. over the place that's mm-hmm. just it, it, microaggressions are real and it's yeah. like you're dealing with so much stuff that person typically in my experience has to be one of the best people in the room mm-hmm. at their thing they have to be one of the best people in the room at their thing because it was hard for them to fucking get there and that's that's been that's been my experience you know what mm-hmm. i mean and it's just wild to me to see people because what you're you're telling on yourself when you have a thing where you say it's not as qualified there's a, a clip going around i don't know who the gentleman is but mm-hmm. he's talk he's talking about um you probably seen the same thing he's talking about a uh a show that he went to go see mm-hmm. where the title of the show was a black woman took my job and mm-hmm. it was about people saying like oh people are hiring unqualified this that and the third whatever yeah. and the guy is pushing back and saying my only problem with the title of your show is my. Who said that was your job? Why is right. that? Why is the default position your job? And that's the thing you're really mm-hmm. telling on yourself when you're complaining about this sort of thing because yeah. you want a meritocracy. Well, in a real meritocracy, you can stand this person up next to this person and you could say they are at least equal yeah. on paper. They are at least equal. If you can really make a case, hey, these two people are not equal. I don't believe it's any private company's job to fix systemic. And I think that's a government thing. I think that's yeah. that's a societal thing. I don't think any individual company should be held to that. So if you can say, no, on paper, one of these people is higher than the other, and it just happens to be the white person, give that person a job. That's what mm-hmm. I really believe. But everybody I've known over the years who comes from a marginalized background that has made it into these rooms, mm-hmm. absolutely top tier. Yeah. Absolutely. None of us have seen a position where we're in a room of any kind of importance on a film or a game or whatever. And there's just some body in there that so clearly doesn't deserve to be there and mm-hmm. only got there because of the color of their skin or their gender or the way they identify. That doesn't exist. That's not real. That's boogeyman nonsense. And for they, some of the people who make up. And for some of the people who have seen that, it hasn't been the marginalized people that. <laughs> That, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. I have seen it the other way where there's nepotism involved the other way. I have seen that. Yeah. But when you're in that room and you are someone that is not from the dominant culture like that, I've I've never, yeah. I can't, I can't, I've worked with thousands of people on these projects and I can't think of one person where I was like, how'd you get in here? I it's it doesn't, I've never seen it. Like never. And I'm not just saying that as someone who's woke or whatever. You, you're there because you had to work extra hard to get there. Yeah, because people don't understand the dynamics of America. And because, like, even with President Obama, like, marginalized people know he damn near had to be perfect to even run. <laughs> like, so y'all not going to find nothing. <laughs> like, what? Yeah, but but like, on the, the bright side. Y'all, y'all going to find anything? Yeah. yeah. You don't understand but on, the, but on the bright side, once Obama got elected, racism ended, right? So it's all good. <laughs> So, so it's all that was the end of racism, right? So yeah, right. it's all good. It's all good. We are the world. Everything's perfect now, so we don't have but to. But also, about it like to talk about taking my job, if seventy to ninety percent of a company or a school is people who look like you, the majority, why did none of those people take your position? Why was it the only? Why was it only the 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 ten to 30% that took your position, not the 70%. Right. It, I mean, it is, it is a, it's a, it's a privilege issue, right? It just is mm-hmm. the assumption that this is mine and yeah. it can't possibly be yours. And it's like, you know, when you talk to people, uh, not even just in our fields, but like in any field mm-hmm. that come from any kind of marginalized background, you hear over and over and over, I didn't get the luxury of being off you know what I'm saying like not being not being right for something or you know whatever a lot of times 
we all hope to be in positions where we can grow into those positions, right? Um, but that's not reality for a lot of people sometimes. And it's like, when you get there, mm -hmm. you have to be fully functional and you have to work towards like proving your worth a lot of times. And it's like that luxury of, oh no, I get to get there in a while. I get to grow into it. It's not afforded to everyone, right. you know? And, and it's crazy. And I think the for me personally, the most insidious like sort of thing when you deal with anything that's like racist, sexist, any of the is mm -hmm. or whatever, in mm -hmm. my opinion, is it's not the person that's overt. It's not yeah. the person that's like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. It's the person that thinks that they're doing the right thing mm -hmm. and that they have the best intentions, but they don't realize until they're called on it. Hey, you said this. This is not possibly the right way to go you know what I mean and it's like mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable and I get why people don't like it and everybody wants to be the hero of their own story and think about yeah. things a certain way but it's like to me that's the harder road it's easier to deal with someone who's overtly an ist in any of those things right you can choose to deal with mm -hmm. them or not but man it sucks when you have a person that's like you 90 percent of the way there but that mm -hmm. last 10 percent is really fucking things up so <laughs> yeah it's 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 yeah, that's tough. So, yeah. and a sudden realize, uh, well, a recent realization that I've had, um, you know, I've been a, perf a perfectionist all my life. I'm a recovering perf perfectionist. I feel like I'm seventy percent delivered from perfectionism. Mm. But if I didn't start off as a perfectionist, being a black woman who looks ten to fifteen years younger than I actually am, I would have it became a perfectionist anyway because I'm not allowed to make a mistake at work. Yeah. And so, you no. Know, as much as I am a natural perfectionist, some of my perfectionism comes from that. Where, if I look like myself and I make a mistake at work, it is not taken as the same as somebody who's in the majority who makes a mistake, a more egregious mistake. I've made lesser mistakes that have been taken out of, like taken, responded to in a way that it it makes it seem like I, it was my fiftieth mistake and it was my first mistake. Yeah. And and that that is confirmation bias, right? Again, it's somebody telling on themselves because they're looking at you and questioning at least, is this person really capable? Yeah. And then being a human, you make a mistake. And then now when they talk to you about the mistake, it feels worse because it's not about the mistake itself. Yeah. It's about the underlying thing. This is that last 10% that I'm saying is like, yeah. oh, I didn't think you could do this. And now you've shown me that you've made a mistake. Maybe you really can't do this, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's a weird, you know, self-confirming bias that is already there. And how do you combat that from your position? You know what I'm saying? Like where, you, mm -hmm. where you're getting talked to, how do you combat that? How do you go, oh, wait, 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 no, no, no. Let yeah. me explain to you why the systematic racism in your head is actually making <laughs> yeah. this worse than it seems. You know what I mean? It's like, that's not, it's a weird it's a weird thing. So that's what I mean, though, because like by the time, you know, 10 years from now, you've got another decade of experience doing what you've been doing. OK, by the time you get to that point, you have been through things like that. Yeah. And that's that's what I mean. You get into that room and you are not the person that's going to fumble anything because mm -hmm. you've been through those things. And other people have been afforded the opportunity to say, hey, I fumbled some stuff. Um, and even if they really, uh, and I think everybody should be afforded this up to a certain point. Hey, yeah. I fumbled this thing. I messed it up. Let me go fix it. Boom. And then you've got to go okay. fix it. All right. That's what you would hope for, for everybody. Yeah. To me, to me, equality is not everybody being like, you made a mistake, you're out of here. Yeah. Equality is more like, hey, all right, cool. We're all humans. We all have the grace to make a mistake every once in a while and to correct right. it, right? Again, up to a certain point, you don't want to be like, hey, I just cost the company you yeah. know, 30, $30 million. Oops, right? I think you got to be out whoever you are, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's you can't do that. But it, it's like, you just want people to be afforded the opportunity to just be human um, yeah. and not have to be perfect machines, you know? But, yeah, equality and equity is not... You treating everybody like you treat the disenfranchised is the disenfranchised being treated like you treat the yeah, non-disenfranchised. 
A hundred percent. And you see that with everything, like a lot of stuff. And now I'm really going woke, but you see that with a lot of stuff in our, our, um, our society, you know, like I saw, I saw something the other day and it was like, you know, yes, the person working at McDonald's making Mm -hmm. burgers should be able to afford to pay their rent with the money that they make at McDonald's. Yes. This, you know, read that again or whatever. And it's Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's exactly that. Like when people were pushing for a minimum wage hike, you saw all these people in different industries going, well, why should someone making a burger make as much as, you know, and my son's an EMT, so I'll just use him like you, an yeah. EMT or this person it's or like, that person. Or you whatever. should make more too. <laughs> exactly. A rising tide raises all boats. If you want to say there's a differential in pay that should occur because someone else is flipping a burger and it takes more skill to get somebody out of a cardiac arrest episode, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, you can make that argument. But then if this person goes up, so do you, right? And it's Mm -hmm. like, that's the way it should be. It shouldn't be, no, we got to keep the bottom down. Like, that's weird to me. That doesn't make any sense to me. But it's all opinions. I'm sure there's going to be somebody watching this that's like, no, here's why that's wrong. You know what I mean? It's like, (laughs) I'll never read it. So there you go. (laughs) And another thing is like, the person in the majority, like we're seen as like, oh, we knew they were going to make that mistake. But the person in the majority is always seen through a lens of p- potential. So no matter how many mistakes they make, they still have the potential. And I remember being at a previous place. Um, and I like, first of all, I knew they didn't want to hire me. They wanted to hire another dude who was like who they had to have as a freelancer, but he couldn't pass certain tests. And so they had to hire me. And it, it just was like, I remember talking to my coworker. We got hired um, pretty much at the same time. He's a white man. He was like like the golden boy. But we would have these conversations. And he, like, it was one of those relationships I've learned where they, like, he told me all his stuff, but I didn't tell him all my stuff because that's how, that's how you got to do it as a, a, a person of color sometimes. But he would, like, tell me about all these things that he would be complaining about. And it's like, I'm complaining about the same things, but I'm going through tougher times at this place. Mm -hmm. And that's why people of the majority think when we're at the same place that they are, that we went through the exact same thing they did, which sometimes is like way less. And it's like, no, we went like that, that little race of like equity or whatever, where it's like, we got to go to over the hurdle. We got the rocks in our way. But, but but because we're like Usain Bolt fast, we're still keeping up to you. Mm-hmm. But we went through way more. That's than- the that's the part where, for me personally, my own personal journey, right, is uh-huh. because of how I grew up. So like in particular, right, I have my father's features. So I look like you would say like, oh, he could be Hispanic, right? Like my father's Puerto Rican. Uh-huh. But my father wasn't there. And I grew up with the entire black side of my family. Right. Mm -hmm. My uncle, my uncle used to just walk into the room and just mush me when I was a little kid and just be like, little white boy, and just mush me. Right. (laughs) And it's like, but, but I grew up with the entire black side of my family. So in my heart, in my soul, I'm black. And only Mm -hmm. now as an adult do I realize that when I look at my other friends who are darker than me, Mm -hmm. oh, wait, yeah, I'm, I know who I am. I know how I feel. I know how Mm -hmm. I grew up. That's not how the rest of the world might encounter me or the rest of the Mm -hmm. world might see me. And because of that, I've been afforded situations Mm -hmm. that if my friend had the exact same skill level, even maybe a little bit more, they Mm -hmm. maybe would not have been afforded the same things. And there's a certain level as an adult of guilt that's associated with that, you know, where it's weird. It's like you understand that not everybody is going to be able to have your experience. Right. I've also been in situations where people let their mouth fly, where they don't know that I'm who I am. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you hear things and it's like, okay, I know I'm not messing with you. Like, you know what I mean? And it's like, and when I was way younger, there were a couple of incidences where I thought it was right to like, just at that moment, come on my face, like professionally. Mm -hmm. And I think as I've gotten older, what I've realized is step one is, okay, I'm not messing with you. Like, I know right. what you're on. I see what you're doing. That's mm-hmm. not what I'm on. I'm not messing with you. Then mm-hmm. if they take it to a step two and they say something overt, I try to pull them to the side, let them know how I feel and how I am. So mm-hmm. that way they know 
I'm not gonna change their heart. I'm not gonna change what right. they say. But the fact that I'm not involved in HR, or I'm not involved in anybody, and I'm just pulling to the side and we're having a simple conversation or whatever, to them, it lets them know, okay, I can't signal that in front of him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like I can't do that. So any room that I'm in becomes more secure because I'm there. You yeah. know, and it's like to me, that's that's a better way to go with some of mm-hmm. that stuff. You know, but it's like it's a shame that people have so many hangups because there's only one human race. Everything else is made up. Everything else is like, you know, yeah, we have cultural differences and all that kind of stuff. But when you get down to the DNA of it, we're the same. Like all of Mm -hmm. us are the same. We Mm -hmm. all have the same hopes, the same dreams. You know what I mean? We want prosperity. We want like good stuff for ourselves, our family. Mm -hmm. Why has this shit got to be so hard? Like, Why has it got to be so hard? I just don't get it. Uh, I don't know. So if someone was producing a documentary about you, what things would you want them to highlight about your life outside of your work in animation? Oh, how to waste money on a documentary about somebody who's <laughs> utterly boring. Because, <laughs> you know, outside of this, the only thing I have that would be worthy of any kind of documentary is like, you know, I guess really my wife and I, you know, we uh-huh. met in high school. We dated in high school. She was always my one. I went uh-huh. away to college. She went away to the army. You mm-hmm. know, we both had two different lives for a whole decade away from each other. Mm-hmm. And then I, I bumped into her sister one day on the street and ended up talking to her for a little bit and was like, slide your sister my number. And, you know, as adults, we ended up reconnecting. And then over the course of a few years, decided to, like, give it a try. And now 20 years have gone by. It's the best best thing I ever did. So. That would maybe be the only thing that's worthy of any kind of documentary. Other than that, I'm a pretty boring person, you know? Yeah. You think, but okay. Um, and because I'm like, even when I reached out to you, you were like, me? Like, bro. <laughs> no, nah, for real. There's a lot of people. Like, come on. Some of the people that you've had on your show. It's like, yeah, and you you hit all the big ones, and now you're scraping the bottom of the barrel. That's where you at. So that's that's what it is. But the thing I like is that because obviously <clears throat> there's internally what my goal is, and then what the transformation of that has been. But for me, it's like um, everybody is important. <laughs> like all of y'all is important. Yeah, there's like to the outside eye because of different dynamics it's like all right this person is is the is the is the pinnacle or this person this person this person but i'm like for my channel the point is like all y'all are important and all of you all have contributed to our industry and all of it should be highlighted yeah yeah maybe i think um you, th- you need to remove that word maybe I shut out of your book <laughs> no no I'm serious <laughs> that's your favorite thing, word <laughs> no the thing is the thing is I see I see um other people like and we all do it right like you put people yeah. on a pedestal, pedestal or whatever uh-huh. and it's like you know you only see the world through your own eyes so like yeah. to me to me I'm like oh I see these people that I put on a pedestal Right. For them to be up there, I have to be looking from down here. So from my perspective, I look at it and go, oh, okay, cool. I have to try to get there one day. Right. And it's like, that's the way it is. And then you do have a moment where you look back and you go, okay, well, what projects have I worked on and what have they done and this and that and blah, 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 blah. And even then, because I'll tell you, I've worked on a lot more stinkers than I've worked on things that I'm really, really proud of. I've only worked on a cup, a couple of things that I'm really proud of. Mm-hmm. Um you know, um, but uh, you just have this idea, like just you're at a certain spot and other people are up here. And then those are the people that you're chasing. So when yeah. you hear somebody else say, oh, you're up there. And it's like, no, I'm telling you I'm not. Cause like, look at these <laughs> other dudes. Like, so you just see it how you see it. You know, it's like, that's yeah, yeah, it yeah. Is, you know, yeah. And like my goal and what is internally in me is like, these people are up on this pedestal and my platform puts the steps down to bring them they're they're on the ground mm. with us they're human beings like us 100%. that's why i say that this is this this platform is about highlighting you all as human beings not mm-hmm. scraping you for gold and being like how can i get into the industry it's like no who are you as a person 
And it's like, oh, I experienced that too. Oh, I think that as well. So yeah, yeah. And the work you're doing is great. Like you know, it's it. There is definitely a void, you know, mm-hmm. that you are filling by doing what you're doing. You know what I mean? So like, on behalf of nerds everywhere, thank you. You know what I mean? <laughs> so yeah, serious. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to highlight you and thank you for your continued support in the inbox of my, I appreciate of, it. Of my platform. Yep. Always, always. And to everyone out there, I want you to like so I know it's real and comment tell me how you feel. Subscribe to Seal the Deal and sign up for post notifications to show your zeal and I'll see you in the next video. Stay woke. <laughs> Stay woke. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs>